Thank you. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. Thank like, you so much for my card. Oh. That's <laughs> close. Short stuff I can help you. Well, I oh. have. I scraped their fence one time. <laughs> Okay, so what I want to do here, I want to do kind of some of the second group of problems on those formal definition problem set, the book problem set. Uh, let's look at the ones where we're going to use the epsilon delta definition to prove that the limit is L. Okay. <clears throat> that we're going to calculate the limit that proves that that's the limit. That, and essentially that that limit exists. So what is this thing doing? What is it? Oh, there it is. So this is, I'll do like, I'm going to do the even ones because I assigned the odd ones. Okay? So no, you assigned the even ones. We should probably do the odd ones. No, I don't think so. I don't think so. Yeah, so let's we'll, we'll go through several of these. Did everybody get is twenty is twenty five okay? No, I no? Even okay. know what it was let's go through that one too. So we'll do twenty six. All right, so The <clears throat> limit of 2x plus 5 as x approaches negative 3. You want to prove that that exists. Okay. Well, what is that limit? Okay. So how can we do this? What's our... Our formal definition just says it connects two things, right? It connects the width of the target interval, so epsilon, to the width of the neighborhood, so delta. Okay. So where do, what's the expression we always start with then? What, what defines epsilon? Okay, so the distance between f of x and l is defined by epsilon, right? And we want to connect that to the width of the neighborhood, which is defined by the distance between x and c, right? Okay, makes sense? All right, so we'll start here. What is, for our function, what does that expression become? That in plus five. Okay, minus negative one is plus one. It has to be less than epsilon, right? So what are we gonna do algebraically? <coughs> algebraically. Okay, so we'll simplify inside the absolute value bars, and that's just gonna give us what two x plus four or two x plus six. Okay, we can factor out an absolute value Negative. of 2, which is 2, right? Yeah. Make sense? Do you want the 3 to be positive or negative? It doesn't matter. Well, right, uh, we'll, oh, it's going to be negative. Okay. You'll see why in a second. You probably already do. So what's the last step then? Over two. To make it look like this. I'm going to divide by 2, and then I'm going to get x plus 3. But if I write that as a difference, that's x minus negative 3. Negative three. Okay. It is less than epsilon over 2, right? Well, that is in the form of our definition of delta, right? What's c? Negative three, right? And so therefore, this is delta, isn't it? That makes sense. So epsilon over two equals delta, and that's our proof, right there. That's our proof, because we can write delta in terms of epsilon. Okay. How would it not? How would you uh, do that? And have it not? If there were no connection between epsilon and delta. So yeah, you so wouldn't be able to get like x minus. Right. Or, you would do, okay. Yeah, you wouldn't be able to get something of that form. Okay, why? I bet you you could even tell me here 
if we think about the graph of this, I bet you could even tell me why, in this case, delta is defined as epsilon over 2. In other words, delta is only half as wide as epsilon. What about this function predicts that? Okay, let's see. What is it? The slope. Sure. Okay, if we, if we graph this thing, look what it looks like. This function is what? Uh, 2x plus 5, so... There's five, so we're going to go from there. There's, it's going to look something like that, right, if I graph this function. If x is negative three, so this is the x value we're choosing right here. There's the x value I'm choosing. There's the y value. What do you notice? Any width delta that I choose, like let's say we're going to go plus or minus 1. So that's going to be my neighborhood of x values. What's that do? What's that do to the width of, of, of epsilon? Well, this function right here corresponds to that y value, or that value, x value. This x value is going to correspond to, if I drew this properly, it should have gone up to like about there, gives me that y value. And so the blue neighborhood of x values corresponds to the red range of epsilon values, right? My target accuracy, because the slope is steep, Every little bit of width I'm adding, every, every unit of my domain's interval, the neighborhood, is going to be amplified by 2 because the slope is, is making the vertical part stretched out. Does that make sense? Right? The rise is always going to be twice as big as the run. So that's how I get that connection. The delta is just epsilon over 2. right? If epsilon is 2, then delta is 1. So can we essentially stop doing work once we get it to the form of x minus an integer? Because that in and of itself proves that it is... Uh, yeah, well, it, well, no, because that integer has to be... Look what happened. That integer is c. Oh, it has to equal, mm -hmm. right? Is delta always the x value? Yes. Yep. Okay. Oops. So for 25, mm -hmm. then that's not proven? No, it is. But it works. Yeah. But you should be, on 25, you should be able to, to transform that into the x absolute minus value of x minus 2 is less than so delta. Plus Oh, it's minus five. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So for twenty-seven, when you when you have like half times x mm -hmm. minus four, would you take out a half? How well, yeah. Factoring out a one half is the same thing as multiplying multiplying each term by two, right? See what I'm saying? Yeah. So then you get negative e. Right. right. So then it would be proven. No, it is. It's proven. Let's look at. Let's look at number, we'll do a harder one, let's do 28, okay? So 28. Essentially, as long as you can prove that C is equal, or the x value. Okay, so what's, what's my, boy, that's a kind of bad one. What's my limit here? Yeah, we don't want to mix number though. What's that going to be? Well, I want it as a fraction, a proper fraction. 20, 20 thirds? Mm -hmm. 20, oh, yeah, 20 thirds. You're right. Yeah, yeah 20 thirds. Okay. So then we're going to start off with the expression the difference between the function and 
the limit is defined as epsilon, right? So the absolute value of 2 thirds x plus 9 minus 20 thirds is less than epsilon. Agree? Absolute value of f of x minus l. Right? So if I combine like terms here, what do I get? That just becomes absolute value of 2 thirds x. Sorry, how did you get the 2 Yeah, thirds? I don't think it's actually 20. Yeah. It's not 20. Isn't it 9 times 3 plus yeah, 2? Yeah, it's 9 times 3 plus 2. It's yeah, it's 29. Oh, yeah, yeah, 29. That's right. What's yeah. ah. <laughs> yeah. Weren't you the one that suggested that in the yeah. first place? <laughs> yeah. There we go. So 9 minus 29 thirds is just... Uh, is this just minus two thirds, right? Yeah, everybody agree? Okay, so now what do I do? Can factor out an absolute value of two thirds, right? Which is two thirds times the absolute value of x minus one is less than epsilon, last step? Multiply by three halves. Multiply by three halves. So absolute value of x minus one is less than epsilon, oh sorry, uh, three halves epsilon. Right? And that matches the form, does it not? Absolute value of x minus c is less than delta because what is c? One. Right? Magic. And so we end up getting a connection right there. So delta equals three halves epsilon, which makes sense, doesn't it? The delta is going to be wider this time because the slope is less than one. You look at it graphically. Not that you have to. If you want to make sense of that. It does make sense, correct? Oops. That's supposed to be an epsilon. Delta minus three halves is negative two. Okay. Right? All right, so now what about something like number 30? That's a weird one. Questions on this? There's still a question. So I end mine with x minus eight. And it's supposed to be negative four. Oh, okay, so what you I know what happened. Uh, you, as x approaches negative 4, you're going to get um, you're going to get negative 3 for your limit. Right? And so then when you so on 27 then you got this, right? You got absolute value of one half x minus one minus negative three. See what happened is you got a four there and you should have gotten a two. Um, See? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm ready for 30. Okay, so yeah, 30. 30 is the easiest one on here. You'll see why in a second. Oh, no, because it's just the that. It just is. OK. OK, what's the limit of negative 1 as x approaches anything? Negative 1. Negative 1. Yeah, negative 1. Right? By substitution. There are no x's to substitute for, right? And when we look at a graph of this, this will totally make sense. So it's negative 1. All right, so then. What does the absolute value of f of x minus l become? Zero. Yeah. Right? So this just becomes the absolute value of negative 1 minus negative 1 is less than epsilon. Well, that's just 0 is less than epsilon. So do we just does not prove it in itself? Uh, it, yeah, it does. It does because zero is always less than epsilon, yeah. right? And so what that tells us is that delta could be anything. There's no restriction, right? 
that make sense? Does that make sense? That, that's kind of a subtle thing, but what's delta have to, well, there is no delta. So there are no restrictions on delta. But there's Look no at, delta if delta is everything. So, well, right, there's, there's no delta in our expression, so therefore delta could be anything, and that's always going to be true, regardless of the value of delta. Okay? So, so, but there's no epsilon. But when you solve it, so when you use for negative one, it's always what it is? Right, so, right. so when you're evaluating this limit, right, Let's, let's look at it. There's two things we can see from the graph here then. So it's basically y equals negative 1. Yeah. There the, is still an epsilon though, isn't there? Or is there not necessarily? Uh, well, the epsilon is going to be 0 okay. at all times. You'll see why. So if, if I graph this function, y equals negative 1 is just this, isn't it? Whoops, that's negative 2. There's the function y equals negative 1. So we're approaching, x is approaching 2. So as x approaches 2, what's the value of the function that we approach? Negative 1, right? But in fact, the value of the function is always negative 1, right? So it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what your x value is, any place you choose, the limit is going to be negative 1, right? So there's why that answer is negative 1. Because the value of the function is always negative 1. Makes no difference what value you're approaching, right? But think about this in terms of a delta and an epsilon. So if I define delta as the neighborhood of values around 2, well, that could be, doesn't matter what the width is. It makes no difference. Regardless, epsilon is always equal to 0. Right? So less than more than zero. Uh, well, it just says that 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 epsilon. How do we want to say this? Um, epsilon is the kind of the maximum. Oh, it's hard to describe that. Epsilon is the width of the, this is really epsilon, this number right here, okay. right? Yeah. Does that make sense? So like if we would look back at a previous example, like what about this one right here? Well, we found out that, uh, that. So isn't x minus 1, f, what, it's not epsilon? Well, then why is it? Why is it a greater side, right, greater than, or less than side if it's just equal? Well, because, because this is defining the relationship between, so epsilon has to be, is limited by this expression, right? Right. Does that make sense? So you can kind of think about this as being the maximum, this is my target accuracy. Well, the target accuracy is zero. There's no error, right? No matter where I go, if I establish a, do I still have that? I don't, but real quick, remember we drew, we drew a, a kind of a general representative graph the other day. I can just redraw it. It just looks like that, right? So if this is, if this is C, then that's L, right? If I define some interval of values with delta, then that, that interval of values is going to define a target interval of width epsilon. So that's L plus epsilon. This is going to be C plus delta. Yeah, right? There's a relationship here. If I want to get within a certain target accuracy, if I want the ant to walk with, with some defined precision close to L, then that's going to narrow what delta could be, right? But look at our problem. 
No. What's the target? Target is infinite. If I make the if I make the the neighborhood that wide, big deal. What difference does it make if the ants, no matter where he goes, it reflects back to a limit, you know, to a, to a functional value of negative one. So it's exactly on target, no matter what, right? See what I'm saying? It doesn't matter what delta it is. I could make delta plus or minus a billion any place in that interval. If the ant looks at the value of the function, he walks on the function, he's always at a, at a value of negative one. He's exactly on target because it's a horizontal line. It never changes. The function never changes, right? So delta could be anything because epsilon is zero regardless. Right? That makes sense. Okay. If you, so, yeah, go ahead. if you like, if you had a, an equation that was like x equals two, would mm -hmm. that mean that you have like epsilon would be unlimited? Okay, so x equals two is not a function, uh, right? And so you'd, you'd have a problem with that. Uh, yeah. Then, then you couldn't make a connection, right? Because now look at that. If I had a, if I have a vertical line then I can't even define a neighborhood of values, can I? Because my x value is fixed. And that x value is producing an infinite number of y values, so it just doesn't make any sense, right? You have an infinite number of epsilon. Well, it's, I mean, but then what if I want to get a, it doesn't work because what if I want my target accuracy to be 0.1? I want to get within a precision of 0.1 of a limit, right? Well, how could I do that? I can't change my x, right? So my, my delta is zero and my epsilon is infinite, right? And you can't even take a limit though, right? What, what, what's the limit? Of, how, how would you somehow take a limit there? What, what's the limit going to be? There isn't one. X can't approach anything, right? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. and, and you kind of get a sense that's not going to work because it's not a function. It's not a function of X, right? Everything we deal with here is a function of X. I got to be able to i got to be able to evaluate the function at x values to find out what the y value is, right? Can't do that for the vertical line. Okay, so what else? I think that ought to probably... So for answering these questions, like for 29, for example, the same as uh, 20 or 30, um, do you just finish with... The absolute value of zero is less than. Well, you, what you'd finish with is, yeah, you're going to get something like when you get that expression right there. That that tells you that okay, if epsilon is zero, regardless, then delta is just an element of the set of real. Could be anything. Mm -hmm. right. Could be anything. Okay. What about did you? How are we with with number? 31 with the cube root. How would you deal with something like that, you suppose? You can't take the cube root of zero, just zero. The limit of, well, sure. <clears throat> Let's do the square root. Well, zero divided by zero. Divided by zero. Because you're just subtracting zero. Right. Mm -hmm. So in this case, the limit is as x approaches 4. What's the answer? Two. Right? Do you have to do the plus or minus? Or no, you don't. Mm -hmm. Just do absolute values for the top. Uh, right, OK. Why do you use the plus or minus? You guys understand why you use the, let me remind you about that. Because I don't know if you ever, we talked about it in Algebra 2, if I had you in Algebra 2. But I don't know. We all, we all smart. Yeah, so, so well, I was gone. Well, yeah. So I wouldn't I think have. You were that was, yeah. yeah. So, so this is this is I think this is kind of important though. This is this is a this is a good thing to know. So why is it? We'll take a little detour here. Why is it that you get that plus or minus in there? It's important to know. So if we're solving the equation, for example, x squared equals four. We all know that the answer is x is plus or minus two, right? Why? What are the steps you go through to solve that? You take square root of both sides. Take square root of both sides. So these are the missing steps. I'll write them in pink. Square root of x squared equals the square root of 4. And what is the square root of 4? 2. 2. Not plus or minus 2. 
2. So that gives you the square root of x squared equals 2. What is the square root of x squared? X. No. It's not. Think about this. That's a function, right? Square root of x squared. Let's try this function out. Let's call that function g of x. If g of x equals the square root of x squared, what's g of 3? Actually, let's just do g of 4. What's g of 4? Square root of 4 squared, which is the square root of 16, which is? Okay. Aha. What's g of negative 4? Square root of negative 4 squared, which is the square root of 16, which is 4. So now, once again, what do you suppose the square root of x squared is? Plus or minus? No. Think what it did. When I input 4 into this function, I got back an answer of 4. When I input negative 4, I got back an answer of positive 4. What does that sound like? Absolute value. That's the definition. This is, by the way, the definition of an absolute value function. So this tells us that the absolute value of x equals 2. So if the absolute value of x equals 2, what is x equal to? Oops. So I can shift back to black because here's the step. So what does that tell us? What are the solutions of that? Yeah, plus or minus, right? If we solve an absolute value equation, we get the plus or minus. So there's where we usually end up. But that's those are the missing steps. That's why it works that way. Yeah. Can you give us a teacher to help you out? Uh, yeah, I will. At least at least to the I've honors never learned classes. This. I've never learned yeah, well that's I mean it's you know, you don't practically speaking, you don't use it very much, but it's it's good to know why that is. And I think I think what it does is I think it eliminates that that question about is this plus or minus? No, it's not. Because taking the square root, if we look at that proof right there, the square root of 4 is just 2. It's not plus or minus 2. The plus or minus comes in because of the absolute value nature of that function. Right? Which you only get when you take the square root of the square root. Of a variable squared, exactly. Mm -hmm. OK, so uh, when you said 35, was it the bonus question? Like, yeah. Is it the hard one? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's the bonus one. So, so then what about this? What do we do? So we want to write this. We want to write the expression that defines epsilon. Okay, so what's that going to be? Absolute value of f of x. So square root of x minus 2 is less than epsilon. Okay, now what? This is pretty tricky. Wait, why can't you have epsilon squared? No, it's epsilon squared. Epsilon times epsilon. Yeah, that's not what we want. We want to <laughs> in terms of epsilon. And then yeah. you square root This is going to be this is so going to be kind of a weird you, one because I mean the whole point of finding out what like like if you had epsilon squared. But what good is that going to do to square both sides? Because the square. It, because then it would be x minus four. No, it wouldn't. Uh -huh. Because the quantity x minus two squared is going to give you x. Uh, minus well, 2 times the square root of x, right, plus 4, which is not what you want. Okay, so what do we instead, if I want to turn this into a difference of squares, this is what we'd call the conjugate, from algebra 2, this is what we'd call the conjugate product, right? So how do we do that? If I want to get x squared minus 2 squared, what do I multiply by? a minus b times what? equals a squared minus b squared. A plus b, right? So we're going to multiply both sides through by the absolute value of the square root of x plus 2. Okay, This is weird. It's a little weird. So we're going to get absolute value of square root of x minus 2 times square root of x plus 2 equal, well not equals, is 
less than the square root absolute value, sorry. Absolute value of square root of x plus 2 times epsilon. What does that give us on the left? X minus 1. X, yeah, x minus 1. Absolute value of x minus c, right, is less than delta. Say it again. Does it matter if you put epsilon before or after that? So oh, it doesn't make a difference. Just a product. Just yeah. Answer. Just a product. Okay, but that's a little weird. We've got x's in there, but once again, we could define some neighborhood of values. Like, let's say, for example, this is stuff we talked about yesterday. Let's say, what if, if x is approaching 4, let's say it's going to be trapped between 3 and 5. Okay? Does that make sense? So if it's going to be trapped between 3 and 5, then what's going to be the most limiting? What's going to minimize the size of this neighborhood? Three. Three, right? So if we choose that neighborhood, then we're going to get back uh, for for that neighborhood, then we end up with an answer. Uh, the absolute value of the square root of 3 plus 2 is just this, that's positive, right? So we get square root of 3 plus 2 times epsilon is delta, right? So no matter what neighborhood we choose, we can always come up with a delta that's going to work, okay? So that's 30, 30, 31, wouldn't it just be? So it's, 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 it's it's since it's approaching zero, it's, it's, oh yeah, on that one you're right on that one. Yeah, okay. yeah, that one's easier. Yeah. Would you cube inside the absolute value or positive? I'll figure out the matters. Uh, you're gonna you're gonna cube. Well, you're gonna multiply. You're gonna multiply both sides by x to the. Two thirds, right? Uh, On, when you do the the one that I assigned for you guys, you're going to get minus what? Zero. Zero is less than epsilon, right? Isn't that minus zero? You can just negate that. You can. Yeah. Okay. But that's got to that's got to be an x though, right? So why can't you just cube that? Well, because I don't want to cube epsilon. Why can't you cube epsilon? <laughs> well, because if I cube epsilon, then I get epsilon cubed. I don't want yeah. epsilon cubed. You want smaller. No. You, right. want the, you just want plain old epsilon. And if yeah. you cube it, then you're going to have to de cube or take the cube root at right. the end. And then so so instead, what we'll do is we'll just, we're not going to cube it. We're just going to multiply each side. How do I get an x in there? That's x to the 1 third. So I can multiply each side by x to the 2 thirds, right? Right, so then I'm going to get the absolute value of x minus 0 is less than x to the 2 thirds times epsilon. But what's, what's x to the 2 thirds? Well, we're, our neighborhood of values is around 0, right? x is approaching 0. How did you get x to the 2 thirds again? Because I multiplied both sides by the absolute value of x to the 2 thirds. But x to the 2 thirds is always positive because it's even, right? Does that make sense? OK. And so then I could define some neighborhood of values again. How about negative 1 to 1, right? So for my pen is driving me nuts. So then what's going to be the, the doesn't matter, right? The most conservative is going to be either at negative 1 or 1. I'm going to get back the value 1, right? Agreed? Because any, you know, either one of those, negative 1 or positive 1 to the 2 thirds, is just 1, right? And so for that interval, 
I'm going to get the absolute value of x minus 0 is less than epsilon. And so epsilon is just equal to delta. Right? Because this is the absolute value of x minus c is less than delta. And so this defines my delta for that particular neighborhood. If I chose a different neighborhood, I'd get some coefficient there. But big deal. I always get an epsilon. Okay. So you can, have, so you can have like two epsilon, but you can't have epsilon squared. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you put zero in for x, you would get zero on both sides. Say it again. If you put zero in for x, would you get zero on both sides? If I put zero, well, but we don't, remember with the limit, we don't ever get to zero. I know, but just like if you did. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I can't say that because there could be a hole in the function there, right? See what I'm saying? You never actually, you just can't. The answer that you just said would be inconsistent with the limit. Wait, but? Uh, the ant, as far as the limit's concerned, the ant can never step on zero. You don't think for any limit? Well, where would you expect to land? I mean, we could, yeah, we could go, we could use our informal definition and just say a cube root function. What's a cube root function look like? Yeah, I see what you're saying. So a cube root function just looks like this, right? So as the ant approaches zero, yeah, it sees a y value of zero, expects zero. Yeah. Well, yeah. So, so, so this stuff is, I mean, this stuff is pretty weird. You know, really it is. This is, don't, I, you know, don't get too hung up on this. I want you to see this a little bit. Honestly, even if you don't get this all right now, I don't care. You're gonna when you come back to it later, like next year, and you see it again, you'll go, oh yeah, okay, now I, I remember this stuff, and then you'll have a head start on it because no one else is gonna see this stuff. I promise you, first year calculus. So it's that's good enough. I mean, here's how you grade your assignment. Did you give it the old college try? If you tried everything and you fought, I mean, give yourself a ten or. Whatever. So yes. it's based on a hundred. So give yourself a hundred. If you tried it all, you did every problem, you gave it the old college try, you did nothing, you got a zero, and just figured out in between. I did one. Everybody probably got a hundred five. Okay. All right. So how much time we got? Hopefully, I have some. So Wait, is, is there a mathematical reason why we can't cube epsilon, or is it just can we just have this discussion because I don't feel like six minutes. Uh, oh, no, no, we could do something. Okay. We could do something. Okay. So I, I, I do want to look at, I want to look, we're going to start to talk about, I'll tell, here's what we'll do today. This will, this will be good. I hate talking about this stuff. We'll, we'll, we'll get this out of the way today, and then we can go to interesting stuff tomorrow. Cool. So some basic limits. These are just kind of some, some properties of limits. Uh, and I'm just going to go through the stuff in the blue boxes in section 1.3 in the first part of that. So you tell me without looking. Based on our discussion, you can do this. What's the limit of B as X approaches C? B. Wow. Yeah. Sorry, that was good. Okay, because there's no X in it, so it's a horizontal line, right? With height B, right? So there we go. That's an easy one. What's the limit of X as X approaches C? C. C. Because this is the line y equals x, right? And so whatever my x value is, so is my y value, right? Or using direct substitution, it just makes sense. We plug c in for x, I get c, okay? What's the limit of x to the n as x approaches c? c to the n. c to the n, no big deal, right? Okay? Continuing. What do you think about this one? What's the limit of b times f of x as x approaches c? Oh, we're going to define a couple things, too. For these examples, yeah, I forgot something. We need to, uh, we've got to define a couple things. Let's define f of x such that the limit of f of x as x approaches c is l. And let's define g of x such that 
the limit of the function g of x as x approaches c is k. So now, what is this? The limit of b times f of x <coughs> as x approaches c. B times, that? b times l. It is, b times l. How come? All we've done. Because c is a and, and, and what happens if, if you if you multiply a function times a coefficient, you're just stretching the function, right? So you're just stretching the y value, so you're stretching the expected y value, right? What, how I want you to think about this, though, is that when we're taking a limit, we can if we have a constant multiplier, so we have a coefficient, you can always pull that out of the limit. Okay, that's how I want you to think about it because that, that's the most productive way algebraically to think about this. So then we would just end up with the intermediate step, b times the limit of f of x as x approaches c, which we already know is l, right? So we get bl. No big deal. Intuitive, right? Make sense? So you can pull a constant out front. Okay, what about <laughs> this guy? What if we have the limit of f of x plus or minus g of x as x approaches c? What do you think it's going to be? Yeah. L plus or minus k. The moral to that story is you can evaluate limits term by term. Right? So we can just, if I have a string of a bunch of a, of a sum or difference of a bunch of limits, I can just deal with them individually, which is handy. Okay? Uh, moving on. How about, okay, this is one. The limit of the product of f of x times g of x as x approaches c. L times k. That's it. Yeah. Very, very handy. We'll, we'll make liberal <laughs> use of this throughout the throughout the course. And then with a with a quotient, same deal, right? As long as the bottom limit is not zero, of course, you can't divide by zero, right? But you get the idea. And then power. What if I did the limit of f of x to the n? I'm going to get back an answer. L to the n. L to the n. Very good. Okay, so we're out of here. When? Okay, I guess we're probably going to call it. Okay. okay. Now we're ready to roll tomorrow. Tomorrow we're going to make some grand things. Make some time.